This week's episode of the Moonlight Graham Show is brought to you by The People's Company. That's right, they are back as a sponsor because so often I hear from farmers throughout Iowa and throughout the Midwest who are listening to the podcast while they are planting, while they are harvesting. They're in their tractors, they're in their combines, which makes The People's Company a perfect partner for the Moonlight Graham Show here. As you guys probably well know, The People's Company is based in West Des Moines, Iowa, but they've really grown to be one of the nation's leading providers in land brokerage, land management, land appraisal and investment services. These guys, and I know Andrew Zelmer and Matt Adams over there at the People's Company, these guys live and breathe farmland, farm management, and they know that industry better than anybody. So if you're looking to buy a farm, sell a farm, having an auction coming up, call the People's Company. They are the best in the business. Check them out at peoplescompany.com. This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show. Once again, I am your host, Tim Flattery, and our Moonlighter for today is kind of a jack of all trades. He's a retired hedge fund accountant. He's an ex-Marine. He is a an author with the book Incredible Baseball Stats, and he's a podcaster with the podcast The Walk Off Podcast, and his name is Ryan Spader. See, I came across Ryan Spader on Twitter, and if you know anything about Twitter, it's kind of the worst place in the world. It's a hellhole. It's a cesspool, but there are some silver linings to it, and I think the silver linings are you can do deep dives into whatever you're interested in and find that kind of community of people out there that are really nerdy about whatever you're into, and Ryan Spader is kind of that guy with, not not saying he's a nerd, he's an ex-Marine here, but he is kind of that guy in the, in the baseball stats world and I came across his Twitter account and I was really into all of these baseball stats that he is tweeting out on a regular basis which led me to buy his book read his book start listening to his podcast and I just really love the baseball conversation the in-depth baseball conversations that his statistics start And so I was really excited to get him on the podcast to talk about things like Michael Jordan's baseball career, Hall of Fame candidacies for players during the 90s, my childhood, guys like Fred McGriff and Omar Vizquel, guys like that. And what stats in baseball matter today that didn't matter 50 years ago and vice versa? I think that's so interesting because we've seen a statistical revolution in the game of baseball, especially over the last 20 years or so. So I think if you are into baseball, you are going to love this episode of the podcast. If you're not into baseball, this might not be the episode for you. But if you like baseball, if you like stats, you are going to love this conversation with Ryan Spader. And if you like what we're doing here on the Moonlight Graham Show, make sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. Subscribe to the Moonlight Graham Show and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, MoonlightGramShow.com. We love hearing from you guys each and every week. So enjoy today's episode with Moonlighter Ryan Spader. But before we get to our interview, I know it's a tough time right now and a lot of people are out of work. So I wanted to talk about a new sponsor we have have on the show, BuildIowa.org, because the construction industry, especially throughout the Midwest, is still up and running and hiring. So I was just on this website, buildiowa.org, and what really stood out to me was how much the professional men and women in this industry make. Did you know that professional estimators on average make between sixty-two and eighty thousand dollars a year. How about crane operators? What a cool job that is. They make between sixty and seventy grand a year on average. The other great part about buildiowa.org is how they spell out exactly how you can get started in the twenty-seven different careers they have listed on the website. They have active resources to companies that are training and hiring. That's right, hiring right now. We know some of you moonlighters are looking for a career change change, or perhaps you've been impacted by this pandemic, if that's you, head on over to buildiowa.org and check out the incredible careers available right now in the construction industry. There's also a link to a job board that lists active jobs that are open right now. The good people at Build Iowa are here to help, and they want to make you aware that there are rewarding career options available for you. 
And for those of you on social media, check them out. You can find them, Build Iowa, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. That's right, buildiowa.org. Sounds good. Well, so Ryan, I'm looking at your, your Twitter profile, and it looks like you know, you're an author, you're a podcast host, of course, with the Walk Off Pod. You uh, have worked at a hedge fund as an accountant. You're a, a marine. You know, what is your dream job? Because it seems like you've done about it all so far. <laughs> I don't know about all of that, man. Uh, dream job. Uh, in a perfect world, I could be a GM someday for a major league baseball team and then retire and buy into a hockey team because hockey is my leisure sport. Baseball, I watch, and it's like, um, I'm sure you saw The Hangover, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know that scene where Alan's playing blackjack, and he's got all the formulas going around his head? <laughs> right. That's me watching a baseball game. It's brutal. <laughs> but um, when I'm watching hockey, I can kind of kick back and um, crack open a beer and really enjoy it, really enjoy the sport. Now, it's not to say I don't enjoy baseball, of course, but it's um, a – far more of a thinking game for me than um, some of the other sports. And hockey is just one that I really appreciate and I really love. What got you into baseball in the first place? My father, man. Same story as you, I'm sure. Uh, Every kid, you know. My my father loved baseball. His father loved baseball. And um, I started playing at, I don't know, three years old, maybe four years old. And um, so ever since a young age, really been a big baseball fan been playing it for years um i i think i really fell in love with the game when my father started taking me to a, games at veteran stadium for phillies games as awful as that stadium was um there was one time in particular my uh my parents didn't have much money growing up when i was a you know when i was growing up when i was a little kid uh but my father had um a friend who gave him seats to a uh, Phillies game in the front row and um, there was an injury uh, break in the play and for whatever reason a pitcher can't throw pitches to stay warm during this like injury break so what he was doing was throwing the ball to Rico Bronia who was the first baseman oh, for yeah. the Phillies at the time yeah yeah and the ball got away from Bronia skipped over towards us uh, hit it hit the as you can imagine a pitcher throwing it it hit the uh, siding pretty hard bounced away and then I was reaching for the ball I couldn't reach it my father grabbed me by the feet and kind of <laughs> wheelbarrowed myself onto the field reaching for the ball still just a bit out of my reach there's this guy back at, back then you could bring whatever you wanted into the ballpark and this guy had a fishing net and he's reaching for the ball as well my father tries to push me up a little bit more the um, gate right there kind of swung open and he dropped me on the field and Rico Bronio was walking over and uh, then he starts hustling over picked me up gave me the baseball you know gave me one of those little pats like ah good job rusty type (laughs) deals put me back in my seat and uh, I I just that moment stands out to me like I I absolutely loved baseball ever since then and uh, wouldn't you wouldn't you believe it that Rico Bronio went on to he um, hit a game tying and then a go-ahead home run in that game and um, it was, I don't know, big night. It's something that I remember since I was probably only seven, eight years old at the time. Nowadays, you might get kicked out of the park for falling onto the field like that with all of, like the streakers that we've had over the years have really increased security. It's not like the 90s anymore. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, though. I think if you kick a seven-year-old out for falling on the field, you're probably going to hey, look Philly, pretty bad on the social media. I, I won't count Philly out of anything, though. I mean, those, those fans are crazy there. Oh, just don't bring up snowballs from 1967. Right, I'm so sick of that. <laughs> you you kind of mentioned it there, being a, a child of like you know baseball in the 90s, and I was that way too. What was your baseball card collection like as a kid? Uh, it was interrupted. I, if what I recall, I I interrupted it briefly for uh, Pokemon cards. I don't know why. Oh, no, dumb thing to do. Uh, but I think that was again. I was probably right before or right around that time when I I really fell in love with baseball and then it shifted. Um, I had, of course, all the cards that, you know, nowadays aren't worth anything from the eighties to two thousands. But then I had a a solid, um, some solid ones that I had gotten from my father. Uh, I had a 68 Mantle, 68 Ryan rookie, um, 69 Reggie Jackson rookie, a couple of those 1985 Olympic Mark McGuire rookies that were, they were pretty valuable at the time. I think they were worth like 
200 bucks, but now they're worth like 10. Um, but it, so most of the good baseball cards that I had were, um, from my father. Uh, I did have a collection or I, I, I keep saying past tense. I, I still have these, you know, my, cards in mom's basement, <laughs> you know? Oh, exactly. Uh, but I, I had a, um, collection of, uh, one of my favorite ball players growing up, uh, Pat Burrell when yeah, they started mass the pro- absolutely start mass producing these um cards and you could you had you know every single year a guy had 300 different types of baseball cards and i, I probably had about 500 different pat burls including uh i don't know like 10 or 11 of them were signed a couple of those game bat and jersey cards which i don't it still doesn't i i'd much rather get a, a if i'm a kid and i'm i'd rather open up a pack and get a a ticket or something that says, you know, you're in, you can use this to enter in a contest to win the whole Jersey. Don't chop it up to put it in a baseball card. I've never understood the fascination with Jersey things or like game use things that show up on a card. It, it does nothing for me. It's just a piece yeah, of cloth it. for me. Yeah. So, you know, I got caught on your, your Twitter profile maybe about a year ago. Uh, cause I love all of the deep dives into stats and you, you come up with some of these really obscure stats that I love. I've read your book, which was the incredible baseball stats book. I went through that in like two sittings. I read that entire book just because it's right up my alley, but I want to get right down to business with you, Ryan, since we got you on the podcast, I am a big time twins fan. I cried the day Joe Maurer, uh, hung him up and played catcher in that last inning. So let's talk about his Hall of Fame candidacy. I want to get your opinion on it as an East Coast guy, as a Philly guy. You know, what do you think of Joe Maurer's career? Well, first and foremost, uh, you said Hall of Fame candidacy. I don't think it is a candidacy. It's a Hall of Fame career. Not a boy. Hands Not down. a boy. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a guy who was a catcher. He batted 327, 410, 473. That's a 39% better than league average in terms of, in terms of his adjusted OPS with 40.4 uh, wins above replacement, which is good for nearly 6.5 war per 162, which is a very important stat when we're talking catchers because typically a catcher is not going to get to play those 162 games. And um, Maurer is a, a great example of that because he only played over 150 one time, and that was in 20 um, what 2015. And yep. had he shifted to first base at that point, uh, you would know better than me. Um, but uh, yeah, 2015 he was first base at that point, DH. And um, so Maurer had a lot of those 120, 130, uh, 140 game seasons that you see from catchers because they these guys need a break. It's an absolute demanding, demanding job. Now. When we look at that, to me, if you're worth over 40 war from 06 to 13 um, as a catcher, an eight-year period, six and a half wins above replacement per 162, that's absolutely a Hall of Famer. But let's take it a step further. And somebody who, across all of baseball, people who have accepted as a first ballot Hall of Famer, Yadier Molina. Mm-hmm. His entire 16-year career, which is double that period that I just gave you for an hour, he's worth 0.3 fewer wins above replacement wow. than um, Ma- Maurer was just during that whole period. Um, Maurer had he had a really uh, special career for a few reasons. Obviously, he played it entirety in uh, Minnesota for the Twins, and it it was kind of um, uh, it was weird to see because he had that in, what was it his uh, MVP season when he hit 28 home runs, but he was not really a pop guy. I, I think other than that, his his most homers were um, 13 in a season. Yep. Kind of stands, kind of kind of looks like a uh, sort of like a Wade Boggs like type season, right? W- where Boggs had a, uh, I think 24 in 1987 and never had more than 11 or so. Uh, other than that. But well, the big thing the, that kind of coincided as well. Sorry to interrupt you with, no, 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 with no, moving to Target Field, you know, and so they that was in the um, in the old Metrodome, which was which was a much much better place to hit, especially early on in Target Field. If you remember, you know, obviously the Bombas season last year where the Twins just went crazy, but prior to that, Target Field was just a really hard place to hit, especially home runs. Yeah, I, I mean, I, absolutely, but. That's why, you know, I, I like using that 
um, OPS plus. It's that stat that's going to adjust for run environment, adjust for ballpark. And um, Maurer, when you look at what a catcher does, uh, not excuse me, offensively as well as defensively, um, the demand on the body, it's, he's absolutely hands down a Hall of Famer. You want to look at that um, the entire body of his work, his win, his WAR 162, which again I says very important for a catcher is 6.1. Mm-hmm. Uh, you compare that to the Hall of Famers, Johnny Bench, Mike Piazza, and Carlton Fisk. Well, Bench is at 5.6, so that's half a win less. Piazza is at 5.0, 1.1 fewer wins, and then Fisk is 4.4. So that's more than one and a half uh, wins in terms of war. Now, the, war isn't everything. I, I, me, as somebody who's Huge into saber metrics it will be the first one to tell you that. But when you have a catcher who played nearly um, nearly two thousand games, over twenty one hundred hits, we we you know the saber uh, metricians say whatever the, we 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 like to call ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Don't put too much stack stock into batting average. But the fact of the matter is, a guy had a three oh six batting average for his career and won three batting titles. Something's to be said about that. And then his on-base percentage, two on-base percentage titles, uh, and a 388 for his career. There, there's absolute value in that, and that's from again a catcher. So this guy, absolutely a Hall of Famer. It's it, it shouldn't even be called into question at this point. Well, I appreciate you settling the argument for me. You know, we have some uh, here in the Midwest. We get a lot of Cubs, Cardinals fans. You know, that just don't get it because they didn't watch Mauer on a day-to-day basis. So I'm glad that we settled that argument. The next thing I wanted to talk about with you, Ryan, is I was listening to your podcast, the Walk Off Podcast, here recently. You had Jerry Harrison Jr. on, who was actually born in Des Moines. I don't know if you knew that, but he, his dad uh, was playing for the Iowa Cubs at the time. So Jerry Harrison Jr. was born right here in Des Moines, Iowa. And he was telling a story about Michael Jordan when uh, Jerry Harrison Jr.'s grandfather worked for the Chicago White Sox when Jordan was playing minor league ball for the White Sox. And he talked about how Jordan was probably the hardest worker that he ever saw. And I thought that was such a great story because I'm of the opinion that if MJ would have stuck with baseball, he was making huge strides and his stats don't tell the whole story there. Do you have an opinion uh, especially looking at just his stats from maybe that one minor league season in the Arizona Fall League of Michael Jordan's baseball career? Yeah, so it's it's a really fascinating thing uh, because Jordan obviously was, at the time, the best bas- basketball player in the world. I mean, he returned to the sport, and he was still the best basketball player in the world. And I really appreciated Jerry's story, and I, I believe that Michael Jordan is – probably the most competitive li- living individual on this planet right now. And um, uh, I, I also, I agree, if he stuck with baseball, he probably would have made the made the big leagues. Had there not been the strike, he probably would have made the big leagues. Having said all that, I also kind of buy into the conspiracy theory that he had a, a, <laughs> closed, a closed door suspension with David Stern, um, that he was in deep gambling. Um, I, I, not to get into the whole story, and I don't want to speak ill of a dead man, but his father was killed at a, at a gas station rest stop, and you know that's that's very shady, and it's it's easy to I guess hypothesize about what could have happened, but you know it could have been a situation where, and this is strictly speculation, but it could have been a situation where. Jordan owed a lot of money, and he was like, "Well, what the hell are you going to do to me? I'm Michael Jordan." and what are they going to do? Go after your family. And it's a terrible, terrible thing. But it's one of the few conspiracy theories that I do buy into. If you go into Jordan's um, uh, ret- initial retirement speech, he, he said in it, he said, if David Stern will have me back, meaning hmm. he's probably not welcome at this time. Right. And I think it had a lot to do with the fact that um, uh, Stern saw the uh fan backlash i guess of pete rose right the banning of pete rose was not handled the 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 best way possible and pete rose was very much so a face of major league baseball he's the hit king and maybe he wanted to do some uh, do it a better way having said all that i don't take anything away from jordan's greatness on the basketball court or what he did in baseball i i think he absolutely could have been a major league baseball player and I, I really just find it fascinating that um, he, he 
he stole 30 bases in 127 games. I know. Like, that is that is one of the most challenging things to do in um in um in in baseball is steal bases successfully. And then just because I'm a numbers guy, I'll I'll throw this at you. I, I enjoyed this. Jordan had 51 RBI runs batted in, of course, uh, over his 127 Double A games in um, 1994. Well, he scored f- at least 51 points in 25 different uh, NBA games, which I thought was pretty awesome. <laughs> that is incredible. What I liked about that, I mean, kind of the untold story of Jordan's career is that Arizona Fall League, though. And they touched on it a little bit in that 30 for 30, with Jordan rides the bus. But I looked up his Arizona Fall League numbers. The guy hit 254 in that Fall League, and that's probably better pitching than, than double A. Yeah, I, I, I gotta, you're probably better informed than I am on that, to be honest. But um, I, I, I really bought into what Jerry was t- telling me, and he's uh, somebody who I consider a good friend, and um, he's uh, very well informed, and he's not just the kind of guy who's just going to say things to right. say things. So if his school of thought and his grandfather's school of thought was that Michael Jordan was well on his way to be a major league baseball player, then I'm jumping on board with that. <laughs> right. I absolutely believe it. You know, one of the things that I love uh, that you tweet about a lot of times is you know some of the dual guys like Bo Jackson or Deion Sanders um, in the game of baseball, and I think that's such a unique thing that's kind of gone from the game. We talked about it with Jordan. We saw it with Bo. We saw it with Deion. Uh, we're kind of seeing it with Tim Tebow right now, even though the day Tim Tebow signed with the Mets, I never thought he'd make it to AAA. Um, I think that's probably seen run its course, uh, especially at this point, but now we're seeing kind of a different kind of dual guy come into Major League Baseball or come back into Major League Baseball with uh, Shohei Otani. And so for the first time in like 100 years, we're seeing like Babe Ruth type comparisons to Otani with what he's doing on the mound and in the batter's box. And we haven't seen that type of dual guy before. Is Otani the most fascinating like statistical guy in the Major Leagues for you right now? Um, in terms of the fan uh, fan friendly stats, uh, I would say absolutely because a lot of what you see on my Twitter, you know, this stuff isn't going to help teams win ball games. This right. is fan friendly stuff, and I, I I enjoy doing this. What I enjoy more is doing the pieces where, um, uh, just an example, I did one on Manny Machado potentially being a second half MVP when he struggled in the first half because of that's what his uh, numbers beyond the baseball card said, and he made me look like a genius because he went and had had a fantastic second half. But this, in terms of this fan-friendly stuff, yes, absolutely. Otani's the most exciting, and Major League Baseball is failing at marketing this guy. Uh, Eric Sim on uh, Twitter, E. Yeah, he's been on the show. He's yeah. Oh, really? He, yeah, he's fantastic. He's great, and um, he really does a good job of calling out uh, Major League Baseball. And they're they're absolutely failing this guy. Like, how do you not have side by sides of Shohei Otani with Babe Ruth in people's faces all the time? Um, a number of the the stats that I put out on Otani, and I, I ran a couple of them today just because I was talking to Sim about some of them. But we're we're looking at the uh, first guy with du- double digit home runs and multiple victories in a season since Babe Ruth did it in 1921. The only others to do it are Ruth in 1919, Ruth in 1918, and then a couple of guys who pitched when the mound was 50 feet away and <laughs> it was eight balls to a wall. Um, it, it's, it's astounding that this guy is not talked about more. And what I find even more fascinating is he was recommended to get Tommy John surgery and he said, okay, I'm going to finish playing. And then he went and hit two home runs the same day that it was recommended he get Tommy John surgery. The day before he had homered, uh, which was two days after he had torn his UCL, and then the day after he had homered. The guy had a three-game home run streak with a, tor- with a freshly torn UCL. And then um, all of last season, rehabbing for Tommy John surgery, played. it's, it's amazing. The duration since he torn his uh, UCL, uh, the rest of 2018 with the torn lig- ligament, and then 2019 while rehabbing it. He hit 25 home runs over 130 games and bat at 291, 348, 529. These are not like these are not pitcher pitcher hitting numbers. Right, this guy's these unbelievable. Are, this is an absolute stud batsman, and um, 
then you, you couple in with the fact that he's pumping 99. Are, are you kidding me? How are you not marketing this guy, Major League Baseball? Wake up. Yeah, and it seems like we're seeing more and more of this because of like roster limitations and specialization in pitching has really kind of hamstrung uh, major league teams now. And so you're seeing like at least one or two position guys on each team pitching more and more. So Otani all of a sudden is even more valuable because of this. And we saw it like a couple of years ago with the twins. And I think you even mentioned this in your book, the backup catcher, Chris, Chris Jimenez pitched like four times for the twins that year. And it, it makes me wonder with, like back in the 90s, for instance, John Olerud was a guy that was like 15-0, and 0, I think at Washington State after getting drafted, and within a couple of years is one of the top guys for the Blue Jays and, you know, was a top hitter at first base for about, you know, over a decade in the major leagues after that. I wonder if this day and age, if John Olerud would be one of those kind of lefty relievers out of the bullpen um, or a spot starter even and then play first base on the side. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Oler is one of my favorite players of all time, actually. And uh, he he was. He was 15-0 and in 16 starts, five complete games, a 2-4-9 ERA. And he had 113 strikeouts, just 39 walks. Meanwhile, he hit 464, 558, 876 as um, both a first-team All-American pitcher and a first-team All-American first baseman. Unbelievable. <clears throat> he was an absolute stud. And, you know, it's, it's funny. One of the things – that I um, often complain about regarding Ola Root is he got he kind of got shafted in terms of uh, his uh, I'm not saying he's necessarily a Hall of Fame -er, but he was a lot closer than the four votes that he got it's a it's a really really like it's not does not do um, uh, does not uh, do the guy any kind of uh, credit that he deserves in terms of what he did on the field I mean, we're talking 58 wins above replacement and OPS 29% above league average for his career, nearly a 400 on base percentage, over 250 homers, over 2,200 hits, uh, a batting title, of course, the World Series. And then he gets four Hall of Fame votes. It, it just isn't right to me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, because I love these fun, stupid numbers, I'm going to throw you my favorite Olerud fact. Yes, um, this in, is what I want. Yeah. <laughs> In um, 1998, uh, what was the biggest story in baseball? But, of course, Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire chasing that home run record. Yep. And uh, uh, Sosa finished that season with 6.5 wins above replacement. McGuire with 7.5. John Olrood quietly playing first base for the Mets. 7.6. Best at both of them. <laughs> what did he hit that year? Oh, gosh. You, now you, i got to pull it up. But um, the – I do recall, so Olerud, the record for most games reached base safely in a season is held by Wade Boggs in 1985. He did 152. Olerud had two different seasons in which he got on, I, I can't remember, it's one, I think 150. And 1998 was one of those seasons. He batted 354, 447, 551. His OPS was uh, 63% above league average. Uh, absolute stud. And then couple all that a couple that with the fact that he was a pretty damn good first baseman he had over 100 uh, career defensive runs saved from the first base position all of this stuff 500 doubles like and how do you get four home hall of fame votes from this like who the hell voted no on Ola Rood? like who was on this ballot that this guy didn't rate staying on the ballot I mean, the I mean, steroid era has just warped so many of our minds, especially the voters when it comes to certain things like that, because some guys get lost in the shuffle, you know, with with all of the, the home run numbers and the big like uh, cumulative numbers that came out of that era. Like, I feel like Fred McGriff was another guy kind of right in there. Like, yeah. I, I felt like Fred McGriff was a Hall of Famer or Kenny Lofton even or, you know, Omar Vizquel. Like, are these guys getting their consideration because they didn't all hit 50 home runs during that era? Well, I'm an anti viscale guy, so don't let me go off on that. It'll, I'll take another 40 minutes talking no, about that. You'll I'm actually – I have a bet out there that Vizquel will never get in the Hall of Fame, so I, I was hoping that you would say that about Omar Vizquel. But I do think he is one of those guys that, you know, uh, you know, if he, he's like the modern Luis Aparicio kind of. That's, I think that's a pretty fair uh, comparison, but Vizquel is just an abomination. Um, pardon me. Abomination offensively. I, I mean, you're talking about <laughs> – Two seasons in which he was um, 
league average in terms of his bat. And other, other than that, he was far below. Uh, and th- that's one thing that I never understood was the ballots last year that had uh, Edgar, Mar- or Edgar Martinez out, but Omar Vizquel in because uh, Edgar didn't quote unquote play defense, even though he did in 31% of his games. But I digress. Well, Omar didn't swing the bat. He sucked on, he sucked hitting the baseball. <laughs> and that's the most important part of the game, hands down. You look at the best players in history, uh, Barry Bonds, for example, you're talking over a thousand runs created from his bat, right? Look at the best defensive players in history, and they're right around 200 runs created from their glove. So there's like the bat is the most important thing when you're a position player. I don't care. And uh, with a guy like Edgar Martinez, the only reason he moved, he was a good third baseman. He's actually, uh, funny enough, off the top of my head, he's the last third baseman to start two triple plays in uh, in a season. But um, he was a decent third baseman, but they just wanted to keep him healthy. They, his bat was so potent that they didn't want to risk him being in the field and getting hurt. And I hate the designated hitter, but the American League decided it's going to be part of their game, so it's part of the baseball, and therefore it should be part of the Hall of Fame. It's, there's no question about it. And you bring up Fred McGriff, I think – the Fred McGriff will get in the Hall of Fame and uh, Harold Baines getting in does him a huge favor because Harold Baines got in largely due to the fact that he would have met several milestones had he – and I say milestones. I mean those round arbitrary numbers. Right, but 500 se- home several, runs and 3,000 yeah. hits. Right. And he would have met several of those had he not played through two different strikes. McGriff would have got 500 home runs. He would already be in the Hall of Fame if the strike in 94 and 95 didn't happen. So um, uh, I think he'll definitely get in. But, um, uh, yeah, I kind of went off on a tangent there. I'm sorry. But, yeah, I, I just don't understand the, the, the voting sometimes and where these guys' heads are at because uh, a lot of times they're just, they're just wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know, as, as I'm reading your book, I'm – I'm kind of the sports geek in me or the the stat geek in me is coming out. And one of my favorite stats about, about baseball, and there's so many unique things about baseball. You just brought up the triple play one with Edgar Martinez, but I love the stealing home stats and you've seen guys through the eras uh, that were really good at stealing home. For instance, I think Rod Carew one season stole home like seven times and yeah. and then uh, Rick, but Ricky Henderson, on the other hand, who the all time stolen base king, he almost never stole home. So, you know, what what is it about stealing home that or have, I don't I don't even know the question I'm asking, but I, I saw that stat in your book and it just kind of blew my mind that Ricky, who was so good at stealing second and third, never stole home. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I kind of think that throughout time um, it, it took like a an approach where almost we discovered it a base at a time, like the value of stealing home. It's not there. Right. Right. You're, you're well, far more likely to get caught. You're probably better off giving the guy who's got a 30% chance of getting a hit a shot. Right. But Carew and was then, so good at it, you know, even right. in like the seventies though, in like, Absolutely. you know, that's like not 1908 or something. Yeah. So, so Carew, which you're talking about in 1969, he had um, 19 total stolen bases, nine of second, uh, three of third, and seven of home. And he stole home six, more successfully than any other base at seven, 78%. The other two were below 70. Uh, Carew for his career, only 353 stolen bases, but 17 were steals of home. When you combine the careers of Ricky Henderson, Lou Brock, Tim Raines, Vince Coleman, Joe Morgan, Willie Wilson, Burt Campanaris, Ichiro <laughs> Suzuki, Luis Aparicio, and Jimmy Rollins. You get 7,395 stolen bases and 16 steals of home. Carew just had, had a gift, and his, one of his gifts uh, was somehow to s- steal home plate. I, don't, I can't explain it. Unbelievable. Uh, do you have it like stealing home is one of those stats that like if it happened in the major leagues, I wanna, I'm going to watch that play. Do you yeah. have a, a stat like that? that you're watching for throughout the major league season or you're looking for historically? Um, one that I want to see, uh, I, I have this, I stole from, um, oh gosh, I can't remember this uh, comedian's name. The Red Sox used a pitcher with the same name, but he had this line, um, uh, Stephen Wright, that's what it is. Oh yeah, the knuckleballer. Yeah, but the uh, comedian had this great line that it's, uh, 
he's very deadpan in his humor and he says, uh, I intend to live forever. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate that. And I, that's like trying to carry that with me. But both in the event that I don't live forever, uh, before I die, I would like to see the doubles record be broken. That's, um, one that I've been fascinated with for a long time and it's very basic. You know, it's, it's been a, it, it's had the same record since the thirties. Um, is one that Tris got, speaker or who is that? No, uh, gosh. Uh, I want to say it's not, um, Ducky Medwick. Gosh, I, uh, give me a second. I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up while I, uh, while I'm continuing on. But, um, Vado was the guy I had pegged. I was like, Vado is going to break this record. And in 2012, he had 44 doubles in 111 games, but he got injured, Oof. and it killed. It killed me. Um, I want to say the guy who's re- uh, rec- Earl Webb. I oh yeah, say it is. Yep. Uh, 67. But then somebody else uh, had a um, season in which they didn't have. Um, it was uh, not George Burns. Who was it? Come on, uh, Ducky Medwick had a, a season in which he had three fewer doubles than Webb had, but then he had like 10 more triples. So the guy could have pulled up lame a couple times and uh-huh. be sitting with that, uh, with that, with that record. And, uh, I, I just have been long fascinated with that. Um, that, so Medwick, there you go. 1936, 64 doubles, 13 triples, 18 homers. Who knows how I, I can probably look at it now, see how many of those home runs were inside the park home run. But it, you're talking about 80 extra base hits that were not, by means of the ball going over the fence, right? right. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. So, Ryan, we are in a podcast about the role players and the underdogs in sports. Do you have, like, favorite role players and underdogs, uh, either from your statistical analysis or from, you know, just being a fan of the game? Uh, it, it's – so my favorite all time, I got to go with uh, Matt Stairs. Because oh, professional you know, hitter, yes. So Stairs, of course, was he was my guy with um, uh, the Phillies in 08 and 09, and uh, they, we had the whole "in case of emergency, use Stairs" slogan and everything. And <laughs> he was just fantastic. And he hit that one uh, big go-ahead home run in the NLCS in 2008. And he had this great quote. I don't know if you've seen it. I'm sure you can pull up the YouTube clip where. Um, he goes, you know, you you come over the team midseason, and you uh, you know, you you don't really necessarily fart, feel like you're part of the team until you get that one big hit, and then you know that happened for me tonight, and it's probably the top of my home runs. You get that big hit, and you uh, you come into the dugout, <laughs> and he's like, because of course he's Canadian, <laughs> you come into the dugout, and you're just absolutely getting your ass hammered by guys, <laughs> and uh, Philly, you know, Philly people are brutal, so they right. had they had a lot of fun with that. So he's probably my favorite of all time um uh i gosh i i kind of forgot you you had that question for me and didn't necessarily do my homework but i think a lot of these players who are the best situational players um jason worth is one who comes to, to mind another one of my favorites you know philly guy who was playing exclusively against left-handed batters and absolutely owned them but then eventually became your everyday uh right fielder and eventually got a contract worth, I think, $144 million. Like, Worth was – look at his 2007 season. You're looking at a guy who only played 94 games, had 304 plate appearances, and he had an OPS that's 20% above league average. And you look at that and you're like, well, what, what was he injured? Why, did he, what, like, why didn't he play more? And it, it, when you dig into the splits, it's because, well, this guy was mainly used as a, a platoon player. He was mm-hmm. uh, playing every single time against left-handed pitching over 30 percent of his um plate appearances that season came against lefties he uh, in a hundred he had 106 against lefties 198 against righties and that's astounding given the number of lefties versus righties and you look at the ops 760 against righties and uh nearly 300 points higher against lefties and then he's the kind of guy who just evolved into your everyday player and so those are my favorite types of guys who take a limited skill set and then they're able to grow that and apply it to the game as a whole. I like that. So Ryan, the way we end every episode of the Moonlight Graham show is with the five big questions. And the first big question is who is the best player you've ever seen play in person? Barry Bonds. 
Oh, you saw Bonds. When did you see him? Pittsburgh days when you were young? No. Oh, no, dude. I'm only, shoot, I'm only 30. All so, right. Uh, I saw him come to Philly a couple times. Nice. Yeah, he was unbelievable. I mean, he was one of those guys that it's like a, it was like a cartoon for a while there. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if you saw uh, every once in a while I'll go on a tangent and put out Barry Bond stats. Right. And um, usually it's a lot of the same stuff just because people love it and I get new followers and I want to share this stuff because I'm I love this stuff. And, you know, that's anything I tweet. You know, it's not really for other people. It's I started this because I like baseball. Right. It, it all started because, uh, sorry, taking you now off on another path, but Cliff Lee in 2012 for the Phillies went six and nine and Philly's freaking out because Cliff Lee had this horrible season and his, uh, you already mentioned how terrible Philly fans are. They're freaking out. His Cliff Lee's done. He went six and nine. And I looked at the numbers and I was like, Oof. he was business as usual. Otherwise the record was because they were scoring one run a game. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, did some digging and found that Cliff Lee was the first pitcher with at least 200 strikeouts and fewer than 30 walks in a season since Cy Young in 1905. And I started calling up Philly radio stations trying to tell them that, no, Cliff Lee is still great, right? And I would get hung up on all the time because as soon as a <laughs> caller – as soon as a caller starts calling in as as Dr. Burl, mind you, is the moniker I would use, and um, starts talking numbers, you get hung up on. And now the irony is I do those same shows uh, in Philly – uh, with a a guy who's now a mentor for me, Glenn Mack now. Uh, and um, I do th these these same shows as a guest and talk nothing but numbers. But um, that's that's why I created this Twitter account is just, you know, for me, I like these numbers and I want to share them with people. If people like them, they like them. They don't, they don't, whatever, not a big deal. But Bonds, every once in a while when I'm doing a, a Bonds tangent, I'll, I'll start pulling up some new stuff. And just recently I pulled up this very uh, – fascinating fact that he played 483 games from July 23rd 2001 to September 13th 2005 at no point during that stretch did he fail to reach base safely in back-to-back -back games <laughs> unbelievable it's ridiculous I mean he was walking at like an incredible clip in that era yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen the stats and the videos that, like, you could take away all of his home runs, right. and, and he still leads the league in um, uh, OPS and everything. It's it's absurd how good he was. <laughs> Who's the most overrated player that you've seen historically? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, so defensively, obviously, I got to go with Derek Jeter. Yeah, uh, that's a big one for you on Twitter. But see, I. I People say I'm a Jeter hater. I'm not. He's probably the second best offensive shortstop ever. I say that all the time, right? But he just wasn't good with his glove. And he is so celebrated for that, that, yeah, you know what? I, I got to go with Jeter. He's so celebrated for how good he was defensively, and he was awful. He, was, he should not have been a shortstop ever. Your comparison – your defensive metrics comparison with Cal Ripken Jr. and Derek Jeter blew my mind. People like, got so mad about that. I, I had to look it up. Like, I saw the tweet, and, I, and I've read, like I said, I've read your book as well, and you talk a lot about Ripken in the book, but I almost didn't believe it. Like, I had to go back and look at the numbers for myself to realize that, like, this guy's not just, just trolling at this point. Yeah. Um, and if you, you bring up the book, I, I also – in um what is it the uh uh jeter portion i do the same thing comparing his offense to ripkin and showing that he was um, a superior uh, batting average guy when even when he fell behind at 01 in the count he had a higher batting average than cal ripkin jr um ripkin was probably more powerful than jeter but overall you got to go with jeter offensively if you combine the two take R ripkin's defense and durability and jeter's offense You've got hands down one of the best players in baseball history. Right. Here's a question for you. What's the, tw you know, I've been on Twitter for a long time. It's like one of those love, love, hate relationships. Like I hate, I Twitter, hate Twitter, but I, I also, you know, there's some things like I would not have found your account if it wasn't for Twitter or Eric Sims. Another example, like I got connected with him through Twitter. So there are, you know, some good things about it, but what's the worst Twitter fight that you've been on? Uh, all right. I, I don't, I, I don't like to talk about this one because they, um, it gives these people some sort of, uh, 
I don't know, I guess makes them real. But I get called by a small group. I get called a uh, racist stats man because I'm friendly with Kurt Schilling. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, it's, it's funny, but like the, there's just a few people that will just say it. And um, it does. That's all it takes is somebody to say it, right? Nobody. Right. No, if somebody calls you a name, right? You're that to some people. It doesn't matter why they're saying it, right? And so I've confronted people, be like, "Why are you calling me that?" And they're like, "Well, this is what I saw." And I'm like, "Well, why do you think that I'm 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 racist? It's ridiculous." And they're like, "Oh, I heard you're a bad guy." And I'm like, "How am I a bad guy? <laughs> Tell me." And they're like, "Well, that's what he said." And I said, "Do you know why he said it?" <laughs> Because Kurt Schilling helps me every single year. I don't give a shit about Kurt Schilling's politics. I don't care about anybody's politics. At the end of the day, we all have to we, we, we all have to live in this country and as an individual we have very little say as to what goes on, right? So why well, I'm of the school of thought, let's just try to get along with as many people as possible. And um as far as Kurt Schilling goes, he helps me every single year with my um, fundraiser for veterans in need. Uh, these guys who have lost limbs and guys who I've worked with and guys who I've seen missing, literally missing limbs from their body who need some sort of support or aid. And he's helped me with the Semper Fi Fund. And I've, 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 um, I, I appreciate that. And I'm not going to say I'm not friendly with the guy for that reason. Has he had, has he had some pretty bad tweets? Yeah, sure. Who hasn't, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And for the record, Kurt Schilling's a Hall of Famer, right? Oh, hands down. It's yeah. ridiculous. I can't and, believe he's you know, not in yet. Well, it's people are liars if they say that it has nothing to do with his personality right. as to why he, he doesn't get in. And then the other thing is I like when people don't deny it. And then they're like, well, the character clause. And I'm like, well, the character <laughs> clause doesn't say if you disagree with the guy's political opinion, no matter how extreme it is, you can't vote for him. Because the fact of the matter is, uh, Kurt Schilling won awards for his charity work and his character. He's a Roberto Clemente award winner. Like, yeah. come on. Yeah. That speaks to his character more than a stupid tweet, in my opinion. I agree. What's the best piece of memorabilia you, you own? Ah, uh, so I bring up the Semper Fi Fund thing. Um, and uh, every single year I have um, – so I usually have a ball player sponsor it. This year, I got Edgar Martinez who's going to do it. And uh, whenever I have a player sponsor it, I um, I I send them a dozen baseballs for people who donate. And I I, I wish I could get one to every single person because the amount of support I've gotten doing this. Um, I mean, we've raised over twenty five thousand dollars in four wow. seasons doing this. And uh, but every single year, I selfishly ask them to sign a a baseball to me to, and write Semper Fi on it, just as like a little piece of. Uh, memorabilia to you know it's worthless once you write it to somebody yeah but it's um it's it's just a little piece of a reminder for for me and then hopefully for my children someday to show them that like look at this these are some of the best pl baseball players in history we got wade boggs tim raines edgar martinez lance mccullers jr mitch hanniger kurt Schilling. you got these guys and they no matter how much money they were making no much how much fame they had they were not above helping people in need and they were not above helping the people who fought for you know our freedom uh, and when they were in need and you know it's to me it's just a little reminder of of that is there there's you know there's semper five baseballs and honestly if i never have kids i'll probably donate them to the semper five fund or the marine corps museum or something and it's uh, just it's just really cool thing to have and it's any like any piece of memorabilia it's a i guess a talking piece right you know people people ask questions and it, if nothing else it gets some more people aware about the semper five fund which i'm a huge advocate for and uh, run run that annual fundraiser and like i said anybody edgar martinez fans out there will have a uh, edgar martinez baseballs this year that's great what's the best advice you've ever received uh never say no you asked me to do this podcast, right? And I'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I try to say yes to everything. and the, But um, I, I would say on the whole is uh, for, probably just from my father, which uh, to his um, – to his own fault and his his I guess almost his uh, chagrin at times is just you know be be somebody that you're proud of when you look in the mirror be your own man and uh, uh, all that it's a large part of the reason 
why I joined the the Marine Corps. I, I quit. I was a somewhat successful, I guess, uh, senior head fund account manager. I was doing pretty well at that job, and I, I quit that to join the Marine Corps. Why? Because I, I said I was going to be a Marine. I always wanted to be a Marine, and I was raised to do the things that I said I was going to do. I didn't want to be somebody who um, said, oh, you know, I, I was going to do this, but then that happened, or life got in the way, or it was easier to do this. And, uh, you know, it's something I said I would do, so I did it. And uh, fortunately for me, I uh, made made it through unscathed, did five years, and now I'm I'm on the other side. <laughs> Final question then, Ryan. You, you brought up your dad a couple of times, and obviously we're the Moonlight Graham show, which uh, we take from the movie The Field of Dreams, obviously. Have you ever been to The Field of Dreams? No, I haven't, and I was really hoping to make it this year because – uh, with the Marine Corps, this would have been my first baseball season out of the Marines since I joined. Uh, I was really hoping to make up on some of the things I missed out on. Um, I have had a number of invites and um, stadium visits that I, I had to cancel or couldn't go to because uh, when you're in the military, you know that that comes first. Uncle Sam gets priority. Yep. On your uh, on your time, he gets first, second, and third priority on your time, and. Um, uh, unfortunately I've, I've had to miss out on some pretty cool things, but, uh, you, you brought up my father. I will pass along one quick, uh, cool story is, um, Boggs, Wade Boggs, who forwarded my, um, first book. Uh, he invited me to go to his, um, uh, number retirement ceremony, which was cool. fantastic because it was six days after the book came out and, you know, it would have been, what better, you know, press, right? Well, I was in the uh, freaking desert with the Marine Corps. I couldn't go. And so um, fortunately for me, I was able to pass the tickets on to my father and my little brother. They went up to see Wade Boggs get his number retired. And uh, David Ortiz hitting a home run, which was like a thrill for my little brother. He loved David Ortiz. You got to see him hit a home run live. And then um, even cooler than that tells you the character of Wade Boggs. Yeah. Wade went ahead and sent my father and my brother a pair of baseballs thanking them for coming to see his number get retired so cool and like like to, like think about it like me as the son you know being able to give that to my father made me feel like the man so and now i've never been to the field of dreams i was hoping this year but you know we'll we'll see yeah well if you make it over to iowa you know give me a shout out i'll play catch with you out in the outfield all right well hopefully you have a beer with me too <laughs> that's right yeah well ryan i really appreciate the time coming on the podcast uh it's been fun to get acquainted man so i r- really appreciate you coming on the show I, th- I really appreciate it, and I hope you'll have me back. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Hey, guys. Thanks once again to listening to today's episode of the Moonlight Graham Show. And even though I do most of the interviews here on the podcast, there is a ton of work that happens behind the scenes that you guys don't see that make each episode possible. So I got to give a shout out to the Moonlight Graham Show team. First of all, Brian Sandvig, our producer. Brian does all of the post-production work, and in real life, he's not just a podcast producer, he's also a real estate agent, so if you're looking to buy or sell a home down in the Kansas or Missouri areas, give Brian Sandvig a call. Next guy on that list is Brendan Gargano. Brendan does all of our design and artwork here on the podcast. He's one of the most talented artists I've ever met. And I love all of his work. If you need any help on the design side with logos or anything like that, give Brendan Gargano a call. The next guy on that list is Andy Flattery, my older brother. Andy, of course, has done some of the of the interviews here on the podcast. He also is a certified financial planner. He owns a business called Simple Wealth Planning. If you need any help in that area, check Andy Flattery out. And then, of course, the trusty co-host, Tom Griffin, and my younger brother, Neil Flattery. Those guys are just busy being husbands, being fathers. They're family men, but also they do a ton of work here on the show. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate you guys subscribing and supporting the Moonlight Graham Show.